All righty, welcome back. This is the relationship series for Ms. Jennifer Lopez, and we are discussing the difficult, challenging, and nearly impossible task of being Jennifer Lopez in love. <laughs> so today is May 12th, 2021, and Ms. Lopez is um, surprisingly back in the news cycle. Uh, timing is everything, right? Um, and it is a result of her breakup with A-Rod, or otherwise known as Alexander Rodriguez, the Major League Baseball player. Um, and the recent uh, time she started spending with her ex, Ben Affleck, uh, who she did have a broken engagement with. So, continuing our series, in this segment, we're going to kind of go through her timeline of her more famous relationships. And we're going to, because Jen and Ben are back in the news, we're going to take a look at their charts uh, before we move into all of the other charts, as well as her individual chart, while we learn how to, to examine relationships through the lens of astrology. Here we go. So here, just to kind of bring us all back up to speed, is the timeline of a major famous relationship she has had. Now, the one that is missing is the secret marriage that she had long before she became famous uh, and didn't tell anybody about until it was discovered. Um, but because it's not really relevant here, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and leave that one out. Oh, poor guy. All right. So 1997 to 1998, um, we, she was married to Ohani Noah. That's the secret marriage she didn't tell anybody about. Um, in chart A, right here, this is the chart and one of the relationships we're going to examine. For Sean Combs, also known as P. Diddy or Puff Daddy, or I don't know, whatever name he's using now. Um, bless its heart. Uh, and that was a very famous relationship. Uh, and her song, My Love Don't Cost a Thing, or Love Don't Cost a Thing, uh, came out as a result, or was inspired by her relationship with Sean Coombs. Now we know, um, at least from the news cycle as an information, that Sean Coombs uh, definitely has some relationship issues. He's, he, you know, there's, there's some really good points that we're going to make about relationships and astrology and conditioning and culture and circumstances, right, that shape how we deal with relationships versus what our, our astrology chart says. So uh, we're definitely going to have some really good uh, wealth of learning material here with Sean's chart. But all of this is to say that that song, Love Don't Cost a Thing, inspired by Sean Coombs, was because of a lot of elements in their relationship that that made such a song need, you know, come into existence. Now, the other thing, too, is that if if you're old enough to remember these characters, uh, Jennifer Lopez was very serious about Sean Coombs, although now that a lot of time in relationships have passed, we were realizing that she's always very serious about all her relationships. <laughs> um, but she was bending over backwards for this character um, and it did not go and it, he was basically stringing her along, uh, which is unfortunate. There was a lot of other stuff happening with that. I don't remember all of it because I didn't follow them that closely, but even me as a not celebrity watcher, being aware of that means that it was pretty big stuff in the, you know, entertainment cycle news. All right. So that was Sean Coombs, 1999 to 2001. Now, immediately after that, on the heels of a breakup with Sean Coombs, Ms. Lopez bounces back by getting married to her choreographer because, you know, isn't that what everybody does when they break up? <laughs> you go marry somebody else. Um, we did not include his chart here because, again, he's not uh, he's not significant enough uh, for this series to get into. I, I suppose we could have, but I really had to limit this, so bear with me. Um, poor guy. He seemed like such a nice guy, right? All right. And then, of course, after she broke with Chris Judd, uh, she immediately bounces back by getting involved with Ben Affleck, uh, whose chart is here. Right now, she and Ben Affleck were also very serious because apparently Jen is serious about everybody she sleeps with. Um, I'm sorry, listen, we're all adults. We know this is what's going on. She's not remaining celibate until marriage. Um, and she was engaged to him, but that ended up being a broken engagement. And a large part of this uh, relationship has to do with a rivalry that was happening between Sean Coombs and Ben Affleck. And I'm not completely sure that Sean Coombs uh, was not uh, interfering with their relationship out of spite. Um, but again, these are more conversations we'll have later in the show when we talk about the individual charts. 
Uh, but the rivalry uh, between Affleck and Coombs was pretty significant because, again, I'm not a celebrity watcher, and even I was made aware of this on the, on the radar for the entertainment news. All right. Um, so for those of you who do know the deets on this, the details, please share them below because I'd really like to get caught up on ancient history here. <laughs> and for people who are just becoming aware of these two, I'm sure they'd love to hear the stories too because there was some pretty good gossip. All right. So 2002, 2004, they were engaged to be married. The engagement broke. And then 2004, because this girl does not let her heels cool before she's you know, off to the races with somebody else, she got involved with Mark Anthony, who's a singer, producer, songwriter. Um, now, Mark Anthony is the only one she's had a long-term relationship with. Um, she actually married Mark Anthony and had twins with him in 2008. They were together for 10 years, 2004 to 2014. Um, now, what's really interesting about Mark Anthony is if you, when we get to the Mark Anthony, you see the picture of Mark Anthony, one of the things you're gonna think is the same thing we all thought, and that was him really we honestly when they first got together we thought this was just another rebound relationship like chris judd was a rebound relationship but it lasted 10 years so mark anthony must have really known what he was doing as far as you know managing her temperament and she's a handful so that is the only successful long-term relationship that she has had has been with mark anthony now uh the most recent one that brought all of her her relationships and Ben Affleck uh, back in, onto the radar is her relationship with Alexander Rodriguez. So after the divorce in 2014, uh, three years later, she got involved with Alexander Rodriguez and she was with him until this year. And again, engaged, but it was a broken engagement. So we have uh, quite the track record here of uh, jumping from one man to the next, to the next, to the next, because some people just don't like being alone, I suppose. All right. So let's go take a look at Ben Affleck and see what's going on. Okay, so this is a couple of things I want to point out here. So we actually do have a time of birth for Ben Affleck. So we're actually able to set up a proper chart for him. We do not, however, have a time of birth for Ms. Lopez. So we're going to put Ben on the inner wheel because we have an actual ascendant and we're going to place her planets on the outside of the chart. Now, when you're looking at relationships, um, the thing to remember, and this is true even if you're not talking about astrology, ultimately, when we look at relationships, there are a number of things that are happening at the same time. One, when you're involved with somebody, not only are they having an impact on you, meaning that they're bringing out certain aspects and qualities of your personality and temperament, right? Because um, everybody's, you know, a great partner until they're your ex, and then suddenly they're not such a great partner. The whole different story comes out, right? Um, and also at the same time, you are having an effect on the other person. This is why two people dating the same person are going to have usually very different experiences and outcomes for their relationships because there's much more going on. You are not the same person with this partner that you are with that partner that you are with another partner. There are subtle differences and nuances not only in how you express yourself and what's supported in the relationship, but also uh, the difficulties and the, the triggers and the hot buttons you're gonna push or get pushed in yourself from person to person to person. The only time this doesn't change where you, and you're literally the same <laughs> robotic expression over and over and over again, consistently with each individual ex, like every single ex you have describes you identically and describes the relationship they're having with you identically because you are literally the same thing over and over and over again the only way that happens is if a you're a robot b you're a sociopath or a psychopath um, which means that your behaviors are not dictated by other people's input or participation like you're having a whole world happening in your head and other people just happen to be background scenery in your brain um mm. <laughs> You know, or yeah, you're extremely limited or stunted in your ability to grow and mature and change and be more of who you are so that your expression is consistently and identically the same thing from person to person to person because you aren't growing beyond that. Um, so this very rarely happens. I mean, it can happen. So I, that's why I'm putting that out there, but it very rarely happens. More often than not, we are different people with different partners. Um, and the relationship itself, depending on the purpose that the relationship serves, will also dictate and determine how we're able to express ourselves or what parts of ourselves um, 
are supported, right? Relationships are complicated. Don't you kid yourself. <laughs> okay, so the first thing when we're looking at these charts, so again, this we've got Ben on the inside and Jennifer on the outside. So when you're doing a bi wheel, a double wheel like this, the person on the outside, uh, because we have actual houses for the person on the inside in this particular case, Mr. Ben here, right? So we have his time of birth, so we know where his houses are sitting. So because of that, what we're looking at is how her planets impact him. Now, if we don't have a time of birth for him and we're doing a, an unknown birth time for both of them, then we're only going to look at planet to planet aspects, right? But because we do have houses for him, we can, we can more um, narrowly define uh, and more explicitly define like how she might be impacting him with the other way around you've got to look at his look at his planets conjuncting or aspecting her planets because we don't have houses for her all right so when you're looking at compatibility or attraction factors between yourself and another person the thing to understand is that in every relationship we gravitate to people we are comfortable with that make us feel good even the biggest masochists out there don't gravitate to people who make them uncomfortable even a masochist emotional or physical or psychological i mean they do exist uh, they're going to gravitate towards people that make them feel comfortable in their particular dysfunction which is masochism, people who would make them feel comfortable are people who fulfill roles that make sense to them in their particular case, hurting them in a way that is familiar or understandable to them. That is a comfort zone for them, albeit a dysfunctional or toxic one. Um, now, understand when I say this, I'm not saying that masochistic people, however it's expressed, are, are um, what is the word that I'm looking for? They're not lesser value people, they have issues just like the rest of us have issues it's just that there is a very specific and very visible and very unusual so we remember them clearly <laughs> you notice them right away um, and it doesn't mean that they're stuck there at any given point in time you can opt to become a better version of yourself it takes time and it takes growth and it takes healing um, but that option is always there if you're willing to do the work now the last thing i'm going to say before we get into these aspects also <laughs> And this is very important when you look at your relationships and you take stock of your relationships the thing to understand that these relationships and the behavior of your partner or yourself these are not occurring in a vacuum this isn't to say that oh you made me do this you made me be this way what we are saying is that your partner and that relationship is a mirror of your evolution your progress your growth your health emotionally mentally and otherwise at that time of your existence because again we're always going to gravitate to people we feel comfortable with right so if you're not in the healthiest place you're not going to attract the healthiest partners you're not going to be able to have the healthiest relationships more often than not there will be exceptions where someone comes into your life and you happen to be at a place in your life also and your development where you're ready to grow and this person facilitates growth for you. These things do happen. But for the most part, when we're talking about our, you know, horrible exes, oh, that rat. <laughs> um, if you want to get past that and not end up repeating those relationships over and over and over again with new names and new faces, but it's the same messed up relationship. At some point, you got to step back and take a look at yourself and ask yourself, where am I not OK that I keep pulling in people who are reflecting or mirroring back to me these things? Right. How am I not loving and honoring and respecting myself enough that I keep allowing the bar to get this low that I'm bringing this type of person in. Where am I? Where am I being disingenuous with myself or disingenuous with myself? These are the things you have to ask. And when you listen to other people go on and on and about their exes, you know, the things you want to keep in mind are one. A lot of times it's entertainment because it's always easy to bash an ex, and it's always um, it, relieving to point your finger at the ex and say, "This is all his fault. This is all her fault." Blah, blah, blah because it takes the burden of responsibility and failure off of our shoulders, right? When we make it other people's responsibility and other people's fault. Uh, well, this wouldn't have happened if you, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
you know, and this isn't to say that the other person isn't responsible. But when you hear people talk like that, understand that this may be what's going on. So it's not that the other person is evil, maybe, possibly, um, you know, or just absolute, you know, just whatever. There, there's a percentage of that 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 person is owning, and there's another small or great percentage that the person telling this story is not owning. So there's that too. And I don't believe that there's always equal sides to every story. Like it's never equal. Nothing's ever that simple, right? So it's not like the e people are equal parts guilty. That's just lazy thinking. You know, the, the reality is that there are different percentages of fault, you know, or responsibility that needs to be owned by the person who, who created or helped cause the situation. Um, but that's, that's a level of, um, work and sophistication and self-ownership that a lot of people aren't able or ready to do. Um, able because the, nobody ever taught them how and ready because, you know, having that kind of time and space in your life to do the work on yourself sometimes can be a luxury. Um, you know, and you got to understand that too. So be kind and patient with people who have bad relationships in their history. They may be meeting you because they're ready to grow and heal and, and become, like evolve to the next level so they can have better relationships that may be your whole purpose of coming together with this person so don't don't hang them out on the cross too quickly <laughs> because they've got a bad relationship history just saying <laughs> okay so blah 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 now let's look at the astrology so with that said we're always going to attract people that we're comfortable with now the other thing too is not always but sometimes we attract people who make us uncomfortable but only when it's uncomfortable in exciting ways right so when we look at connections between charts or planetary aspects uh between charts what we're looking at is like what what's lighting up right in the chart so if you can imagine all these planets right as little lights on a tree or on a string right so like those little lanterns and lights that they hang outside for decoration imagine that every time you meet somebody, they are lighting up like very specific lights, right? So they may not light up everything, but they will light up specific lights in the tree. So which of these lights out of all the possible lights in your chart that they light up were, is determined by what planets are activating it. Now with Affleck and Lopez, the first, the big things that we're seeing here, which are really interesting, and these are the good aspects, right? Um, is Venus trying Uranus, which is going to give us uh, a very uh, like love at first sight kind of feeling, like instant attraction, very exciting, very like, oh my God, kind of grabs you by the gonads and runs with you. <laughs> um, it's usually like that, that spark or that electricity that you get between people. Now, here's the challenge though, and I'll, I'll, I'll warn you about this. So when you find somebody who has Venus trying Uranus with your chart, and it doesn't matter which direction it's going in. Um, you may both feel this exciting, like bolt of, of electrical, like electric, um, magnetic attraction to each other. Right. And it's very exciting. Oh my God. If you're having a boring life, Uranus with your Venus, Ooh, we, it's really going to shake things up and break you out of your, your ruts. The problem is Uranus is not really good at long-term stamina endurance activities so relationships whether you like it or not are long-term stamina and endurance um, which means that they would have difficulty maintaining this relationship over the long haul without some serious uh, Uranus in embedded into the relationship and one of the things that you were, you'll see later when we get into her chart is that there's there's not near she's got more Saturn than anybody I've seen and not enough Uranus. So she would never be able to uh, sustain uh, a relationship that had more Uranus energy or, or themes to it. Because uh, that is not our girl. She is so old fashioned and traditional, it makes you want to cry. All right, so there's that. Now the next thing that's a real big deal between these charts is Mars conjunct Neptune. With Mars conjunct Neptune, what you're going to get is, um, in terms of sex, okay, and listen, boys and girls, this is the part where we get to the adult conversation. So if you got kids around that you don't want to listen to, or there's people that would be embarrassed, or you would be embarrassed if they heard you listening to this, this is the time to put some headphones on. <laughs> or come back to this later. All right, so with Mars conjunct Neptune, it's an interesting 
uh, it's an interesting aspect. So one of the things that happens with Mars conjunct Neptune, and in this chart, this is going to be, where is it? It's going to be her Mars on his Neptune, right? Is it creates this sexual chemistry that's very ethereal. So this almost telepathic reading of the minds, right? This, this automatic, like, ability to kind of drop into this fantasy role for the other person um, is instant and with with no words right so there's this tr like if you're talking about good sex oh my lord mars conject neptune can give you good sex now here's the catch though neptune like uranus is not good with long-term stamina endurance sort of stuff there's not a lot of resilience here right neptune is very fragile so with Neptune, with Mars and Neptune together, uh, the Mars person can run roughshod over the Neptune person, right? Um, because Mars is very aggressive and very uh, quick. Um, and Neptune is very passive and receives, right? So it's a very sensitive, sensual, almost submissive kind of expression. With Mars conjunct Neptune, what you typically have is Mars directs or leads and Neptune follows. Neptune will have difficulty sustaining uh, this fantasy image or this glam, this because Neptune rules glamour, you know, this glamour sort of appeal for very long because it doesn't do uh, long-term sustainability very well. The other thing with Mars conjunct Neptune is Mars may look at Neptune and see their, their sexual fantasy or the other way around. Neptune may see, may see Mars as their sexual fantasy, but again, fantasies don't last. So... Um, this Mars conjunct Neptune with this Venus and Uranus literally gives us some kerpow, like amazing freaking sex. Good God almighty. <laughs> but that doesn't, listen, if you, if you've reached any kind of age and had any kind of adult relationship, you know, sex is not the glue in a relationship sex will not hold a relationship together it is a lubricant to make the friction reduce uh, so that people can get over those bumpy parts a little easier but it is not glue so uh, with this particular combination mars would have these fits i would expect mars to have these fits and certainly venus hang on a second let's find her venus um so it's his venus venus trine uranus yes So, and just so you know, Venus and Uranus are a little wide, but his Venus is angular, so we're going to give it a little bit wider orb because that definitely counts, definitely counts. Um, also, too, this one's a little bit tighter. So her Venus and his Uranus are very tight. These two, not as much, but again, his Venus is angular, so we're going to give them that aspect. So um, with Mars conjunct Neptune and Venus trine Uranus, one of the things that I would expect is their uh, sexual attraction to each other, their, their, the sexual part of the relationship to go through cycles, um, and certainly more intense at the very beginning or after a physical break from each other. Um, distance, in this case, really does make the heart grow fonder. Um, and wane or become lessened or diminished the the more time they spend together and the more familiar they become because Neptune will also uh, slow down or soften or lessen uh, the sexual um, heat of Mars. So in many ways, Ben Affleck absolutely uh, slows down and softens her sexuality. Uh, which in her case may not necessarily be a bad thing because she's got a lot of heavy Saturn and Pluto. She's got a very strong, dominant, masculine chart. So being able to soften and become more feminine or to express the more feminine uh, sides of herself may be a very good uh, counterbalance for what she works with on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. Now, the other thing that we're looking at with this chart is Venus square Jupiter. So Venus square Jupiter is, in spite of the fact that it's a square, Venus square Jupiter is a very fun aspect to have because it makes thing it just makes things more lovely and entertaining, right? Um, hold to that thought. 
And again, his Venus is angular, so we're going to give it a wider orb. And Jupiter, we give a little bit bigger orb anyway. So it's kind of wide for my taste, but we're going to use it. So Venus square Jupiter is a very happy-go-lucky, feel-good aspect. It's a very nice aspect to have. When you have Venus square Jupiter in a chart, it tends to lend itself to a little bit more of indulgence and excess um, and doing things just for the pleasure of doing them. Now, Jupiter, uh, her Jupiter squaring his Venus would also encourage, she would encourage him uh, to loosen up and to explore more of the things that are Venusian, right, or Venus ruled. So good food, fine fabrics, uh, art, culture, and music, all of the things that make for a softer, uh, more well-rounded uh, existence, right? The, all the pleasures in life. She would absolutely encourage him to uh, expand upon more of. So, and we certainly saw that in a relationship. If you're familiar with Ben and uh, Jennifer, if you remember Ben before he met Jennifer, uh, he was a very casual kind of guy, right? You know, the the his best friend is Matt Damon, and both of them come across as very down the earth kind of guys. You'd expect wearing, you know, blue jeans, sneakers, and baseball caps. Um, and then after he got involved with Ms. A Ms. Lopez, uh, he she oh my god, like the transformation was unbelievable. He went from being Mr. Casual to suddenly being this dressed up Ken doll um, with the mafia don slick back hair, and oh wow. <laughs> We were really wondering if she was literally just kind of dressing him up at home like a giant Kendall for herself. But yeah, she had the whole slick back Cuban, you know, Italian mafia Don hair going on and the very, very coordinated suits. It was, this was a whole other side of Ben nobody had ever seen before. Um, and that is definitely what happens <laughs> when Jupiter squares an angular Venus. That Venus in your chart really gets blown up. Okay. Now, uh, they have a Jupiter trine Mars. Um, it is out of sign, but it is there. Okay, so we're looking at... Mm -mm 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 -mm. Where's her Mars? Come back here. Ah! <laughs> oh my God, where are my glasses? Here it is, okay. Um, yeah, disregard that. So I, you know, this is what happens when you're working with multiple charts. Like sometimes you see things that aren't there. Um, so there is no, there is no Jupiter trine Mars. I don't know what I was looking at and forgive me. So the next thing we're looking at is a moon trine Mercury. Now it is on a sign, um, because the moon here, right? We're not completely sure where the moon is. Um, but the moon is close enough to this degree okay that it's a trine aspect even though they're in different signs and even though we don't really know 
where that moon is. That moon is just close enough to, to the degree that the Mercury is and the moon gets a, a slightly bigger orb that we're going to use that. Um, with a moon trying Mercury, it makes it easier to communicate. It certainly makes it easier to communicate communicate about deeply personal things. Good aspects between Mercury and the moon are very helpful to have in a relationship because it makes it easier for you guys to talk through problems, especially problems of very emotional or sensitive nature. Now, uh, because their Mercuries are very close to each other, right? They carry Mercury in nearly the same position. Um, anything that they're carrying in their natal chart, or their personal chart, that aspects their own mer Mercury, right? So their personal Mercury aspect, any of their personal planets, they're also going to feel and experience with the other person. So in many ways, they're um, amplifying what's already there, right? So men, uh, men huh, Ben carries a moon Mercury square. This is challenging. Uh, he's not a talker and Mercury's retrograde. So he, he does not like to talk about his feelings. He, he needs time to process and be quiet with himself and kind of sort things out on his own because he is a problem solver. Uh, and then when he's ready, he's going to come back to it. But when he does, even then, he doesn't want 26 hour conversations about this. Literally, he will say what needs to be said. He will address what needs to be addressed and he will be very terse about it. And he will have made up his mind at that point. Um, it's a moon square Mercury, especially in the signs of Scorpio and Leo and with Mercury retrograde makes us a very closed mouth person. This is not somebody who likes to reveal a lot about what's going on inside themselves um, and prides himself on being very emotionally and psychologically self-sufficient. So uh, her Mercury near his Mercury also uh, would square his moon. So there's more of that. She may, but because it's her Mercury now, she may often feel like she's being stonewalled because he just won't talk about it with her and it's not that he doesn't want to talk about it with her he doesn't want to talk about it with anybody right but she may not uh it may not register that way with her because it is her mercury that's making this aspect so when it's your planet involved it's hard to not take it personally because that's how it feels now <clears throat> with her she's not much better about this by the way <laughs> her mercury here remember she's got a mercury in leo as well right it in her chart her mercury squares her saturn so again it's the same thing except with mercury square saturn what you typically get is somebody who's very organized in their thinking and they're mostly very literal right so there's not a lot of subterfuge of these characters they don't it's it's just generally not their nature but also too with mercury saturn square like this especially in leo taurus they're very rules driven so they're very much about doing the thing you're supposed to do to get the outcome that you're supposed to get because that's the way it works so uh there is that and also she would make her incredibly stubborn um and not necessarily the most understanding person when it comes to other people's perspectives. So you can imagine that if she feels like he's holding something back from her and, you know, he's supposed to talk to her about it because that's what you do things, uh, she will be relentless in leaning on him to try and get him to open up, which with a Scorpio moon is the exact opposite of what you need to do to get any kind of positive response out of them. Because the more you push, the more they dig in, right? So communications would have been a huge hurdle hurdle uh, for these two, right? Um, and this is not something I would recommend for a long-term relationship because in a long-term relationship, at the end of the day, you got to be able to talk to each other easily and comfortably. And this is not something these two can do. So they may feel like they understand each other, right? Because they've got Mercury almost on top of each other. So they speak the same language. Um, and in some ways they're similar to each other, but at the end of the day, their ability to communicate with each other is handicapped and impaired by the aspects they have going on in their personal charts that are emphasized as a result of being in a relationship with each other. So there's that. <laughs> okay. Now the last thing I want to kind of go over here with these two, um, and at least as far as the favorable aspects between charts, um, is this amazing Jupiter-Pluto conjunction. So right here, we got a big old hunkin' juicy Jupiter-Pluto conjunction. Now, one of the things uh, that I'm gonna give you as a caveat about Jupiter-Pluto conjunctions is this. Jupiter-Pluto conjunction, or Jupiter-Conjunct-Pluto, represents potential, not 
fate, destiny, or outcome. So Jupiter conjunct Pluto creates the potential to amass great wealth, great power, tremendous success, your highest ambitions or your lowest. Um, whatever it is that the person or people in this relationship are inclined to do, it will catapult you or create a force field around you that makes you a very powerful couple together. Now, with that said, <laughs> um, some of you may remember uh, the attempt to make a movie together, these two, that, these two did, and the movie is called Geely. Do you remember this? Um, so you would think that with a Jupiter conjunct Pluto in a chart between two people, that if they tried to make a movie together, that the movie would be a blockbuster success. And in fact, Geely was the exact opposite. It was the, it's, <laughs> oh my God. It was one of the worst movies either have ever made uh, in their careers. Um, it was bad. It was really, really bad. And there was apparently a lot of issues on the set with Ms. Lopez and the people they were working with. So she apparently dealt with a lot of sexism and a lot of racism and a whole lot of prejudice, uh, which did not help. Um, so all of this is to say that Jupiter conjunct Pluto represents potential, not de facto outcome. So if you find somebody with a Jupiter-Pluto conjunction across the charts, there is the possibility that you guys might achieve great things together. More likely, even if you don't, and you might not, because it may not be that time, and there's other factors that go into that sort of stuff. Um, and we'll talk about like a, a very perfect example of amassing wealth and part of a power relationship. Um, in any event, what it will do, if it doesn't do that, what it will do is certainly create an aura around you of a power couple, um, or this radiate this aura of power around the two that makes you, two of you very magnetic to other people, which also may have played into a tremendous amount of the um, jealousy and antagonism the two of them inspired in other people, up to and including uh, a rivalry with Mr. Sean P. Diddy Coombs, while these two were actively in a relationship. So interesting stuff, and we'll get to that in a minute as well. Now, here's where some of the juicy stuff is. So if anybody didn't ask my opinion, and of course no one did, they should have consulted me before they got, got involved with each other, but you know, no, who listens to me, right? <laughs> I would have told them that this is probably not the best relationship they can ever get involved in. Um, th this has no long-term potential and it's gonna cause a lot of problems in spite of the supernaturally fantastic sex that they're having. So I guess it's a trade-off, right? You can have the best sex of your life in exchange for a short relationship that's gonna fail miserably and go down you know, burning flames like a plane crash. Um, or you can have a sustainable long-term relationship that's very comfortable and successful, but the sex may not be so great, right? I guess it's a trade-off in life. <laughs> okay, and here is why, right? So let's start with the first thing. Oh, and this is a biggie. This is a biggie. So these are your red flags in a relationship, right? So they have a moon Saturn opposition. His moon, there is his moon with her Saturn. Now, if you believe in karma and reincarnation, and you really like that word karma, you can absolutely say these two had a karmic connection to each other. And also note that we do know for a fact that his moon is here because we do have a time of birth. So the, his chart is accurate and that moon placement is, is, is accurate as well. So we could say this is karma, this is fate. They were meant to have this experience. This was, you know, all the first up. But what I will say is that all that may be true, but at the end of the day, when it comes to a long-term relationship, the moon sign in opposition is going to make this a drag. Literally, it's going to feel like a boat anchor hanging around your neck. Um, it's not a happy thing to have in a relationship. So here's what we're looking at with moon Saturn oppositions. Typically with moon Saturn oppositions, there's always this feeling that one person is walling off or stonewalling the other person. There's always that block, right? And also too, there's always this feeling that you can't quite get close enough. That they're always holding something back from you. So with the moon Saturn, typically the moon often feels like when they need support the most, they're getting it the least, right? And the Saturn person often feels like their worst fears are being um, uh, 
worked on, right? The, not working your last nerve, but the, their worst fears being exemplified um, by the instinctive reactions and responses of the moon person. So the moon person knows where to hurt the Saturn person the most without actually consciously knowing it. A lot of this stuff is happening. They didn't really, it's literally a case of what did I just say? I don't know what just happened. And the Saturn person often, uh, when they go into self-protective mode or they're coming out of their Saturn place, which with the moon Saturn opposition is, this is going to happen on a frequent and almost daily basis. The Saturn person is often going to feel like they're shutting out or closing out uh, the moon person or making it impossible, which is the more detrimental thing, making it impossible for the moon person to actually be able to relax, right? And just breathe because that Saturn person is constantly coming down heavy on them about the requirements and the rules, you know, and this is what you're supposed to do and this is what you should do and we got to do this. Da -da 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 -da. Oh my God, like living with a, a freaking prison guard, right? Ooh, it's not a great position to have. Now, you know, in parent-child relationships, you might see this aspect, um, which would make sense because, you know, there is that. There's definitely a lot of karma between family members. But when you have the ability to choose your partner, a moon center opposition, unless you're a masochist, um, is probably not the best choice. Um, it will make daily life over the long term extremely, extremely difficult and more important, unsatisfying. There's never going to be a happy ending or a satisfying outcome from all the work that you're going to do with somebody that you have a moon sun in opposition with you'll grow but until you get out of that relationship it's always going to feel like work now they also have a venus saturn conjunction so again more of this stuff that just makes you go oh my god are we here again right so with the venus saturn conjunction look at this right here now, Venus is very important in her chart, and we're going to get to that in a bit. But the most important thing, and look at how close these are by degrees, right? One degree. Oh, my God, so tight. The more important thing is that Venus rules our ability to show and express affection and pleasure, and it's also uh, our relationships, how we relate to people without our genitals involved, right? And listen, if you're going to have a relationship with a human being instead of a love doll, you got to have other parts of you involved in a relationship than your wallet and your genitals. I'm just saying. <laughs> so with a Venus Saturn conjunction across charts, again, this is like a big old wet gray blanket on top of somebody. It's it's challenging. I'm not gonna say it's impossible, but it's definitely challenging. So Venus and especially in air signs. So Venus Saturn conjunctions, again, it's all about the rules and the expectations, and this is what you're supposed to do, and you know, you promised and you said and you're supposed to. Oh my shoulda, shoulda, shoulda. Ooh, wee. Um, and Saturn comes down hard on Venus, right? So it is in this case with Moon Saturn, it's her coming down on him with the weight of her expectations and never really allowing him the opportunity or the experience of really being able to relax around her, like emotionally relax and stop being emotionally defensive because he's constantly trying to explain himself. Um, in the other way around, his Saturn weighs heavy on her Venus with the same things, except with him, that Saturn and Gemini uh, especially will hold you to your words. Talk about putting somebody's feet to the fire. That Saturn and Gemini will absolutely hold you to your words. So you better know what you're saying and remember it and mean it because they will call you on it later. Now, the thing about it is she's got Venus and Gemini. So Venus and Gemini loves to play games with words. Um, and they're, they often forget what the hell they're saying because they keep changing their mind every five seconds. <laughs> because Venus and Gemini is very fleet footed. It's light. It's Mercury's sign. So Venus and Gemini takes a very light, airy approach to these things. And they don't really think about what they're saying. You know, it's just whatever. Right. Like, oh, how could you take me seriously? I said that, you know, I, was, I wasn't blah, blah, blah. So the thing about it, though, is Saturn and Gemini is very in this sheet, in this in this way, he's very literal about the things that you say. So his expectation is that if you said it, you meant it and you don't get to go back and modify or change or play games with words. And, well, I never really said it that exactly. Those are not games you can play with this this guy. And this is especially true because of that moon and Scorpio man. He is no joke when it comes to things like that. So this is a challenging aspect no matter what. In these two particular characters, this is an impossible aspect to have because it's just constant confrontation, confrontation, confrontation about the very thing that's that's 
innately and essentially you, right? So, I mean, can you imagine being challenged every day on things that are natural, that just are natural behavior because somehow there's something wrong with it? There's always something wrong with it. It's too much. For a long-term relationship, it's too much. Now, the times when a Venus-Saturn conjunction can work is if you've got heavy or strong Saturn in the individuals as well as the charts it's because Venus and Saturn together can create organization and uh, structure and form, right? So it is possible for it to work, but with Venus Saturn conjunctions, you really got to examine the individual charts separately and then look at them together. And then you still have to look at the nature of the relationship. If this were an arranged marriage um, or a marriage of convenience, a Venus Saturn conjunction would make perfect sense. And it would work really well because it would hold those two to the contractual agreements they've made with each other. Um, but for a love relationship, it, this is not a happy combination. All right, so there's that. Now, other red flags. <laughs> Sun square that Neptune moon conjunction. Now, remember, we're not completely sure where her moon is, but we know no matter where it is, it's down here between Mars and Neptune. So we're going to go ahead and assume that it's conjuncting Neptune. His sun squares that. So when you've got the sun squaring Neptune moon, um, there's a couple of things happening here. So sun square moon makes it very difficult for you guys to feel like you're kind of in the same direction, going in the same, it, it almost feels like you're working at cross purposes with each other. Um, because when one person wants to relax, the other person wants to go. When the other person wants to go, the other one wants to relax. It's it's a very pushful kind of relationship that's counterproductive. That's very difficult to get things done when you're both heading off in opposite directions and your energy levels are at different different wavelengths all the time, right? So cyclically speaking, in terms of energy cycles, you guys are constantly out of step with each other. Now, with Neptune there, that makes it even more problematic. So if we took the moon out of this equation and just made this sun square Neptune, the sun square Neptune is difficult because Neptune drains. So that Neptune squaring, her Neptune squaring his sun is going to be experienced as a bit of a drain on his energy or his vitality. So um, he would feel more disadvantaged as a result of spending more time with her uh, than actually energized or supported. And also too, there's gonna to be a lot more confusion about the direction his life is going in because Neptune kind of diffuses and confuses. Um, it's not a great aspect to have unless you're very, very clear about where you guys are trying to go and what you're trying to do. When we add the moon in here, because the moon represents everyday living, right? This makes it even more difficult. So the more time these two actually spend living together, the more, um, not depressed, but the more de-energized he's going to become and the more confused they're both going to become about what they're actually trying to accomplish with this relationship, right? So there's almost this sense of losing your identity in the relationship. With Neptune Moon, this may be, this may be a conscious and voluntary thing. She may be perfectly happy to lose herself in relationships um, or in that relationship, but with the Sun and Neptune, losing yourself in a relationship because it's a square is not uh, helpful at all. And more, more red flags. <laughs> then we have Neptune conjunct Mars, right? So look at this. This is, and again, this is almost exact. So we talked about it earlier because Neptune kind of softens Mars, right? And makes it a little bit more passive and slows it down. But again, on a daily basis, they, this can be very um, debilitating because it, it de-energizes things, right? So it will de-energize her. And over the long term, you don't want that. You don't want a huge uh, long-term depletion of your energy. The other thing with Neptune conjunct Mars uh, is that it, because Mars is your ambition and your direction and, and your drive, and Neptune there can also diffuse that as well. So again, more confusion about where you're going, what kind of, what direction are we going in? This combination together with Sun square Neptune and Mars conjunct Neptune uh, means that they're often, in terms of long-term direction um, and cohabitation or living together, they would often be at um, sixes and nines with each other, trying to figure out what exactly they're trying to get accomplished and where they're trying to go. These are the, I don't, obviously we don't know them personally, but this is the kind of stuff I would expect to see with all this Neptune uh, in the charts of couples who have frequently have difficulty showing up to events on time with each other. Uh, I knew a, a couple like that, like literally you had to tell them an hour, something started an hour before it actually did because they were consistently and chronically late for everything. 
Um, and separately, I don't know that they were that bad. Uh, but together, they literally just made things worse with each other. And I believe there's a lot of Neptune in their charts too. I don't have their charts anymore, but I vaguely remember it's a lot of Neptune. There's certainly a lot of Neptune activity. Um, in any event, so with these two, with all this Neptune, I would certainly expect these two to be people who are just for whatever reason, like, <laughs> oh my God, confuse each other even more and uh, make it even more difficult for them to show up on time. Even if they're perfectly capable of showing up on time or early on their own in any other circumstance. This Neptune just does it to people, right? Okay, <laughs> remember, relationships bring out different parts of yourselves. <laughs> okay, and the last one we have is a Mars, Mars square. Whee, this is not great. This is not great. And we're gonna talk about that. So here, we have a Mars, Mars square. So Mars, again, rules drive, energy, and purpose. And when you've got Mars squaring Mars, you've got literally two people heading in two different directions. Um, or heading in similar directions, but literally crossing paths with each other, heading away, right? Or heading right into loggerheads with each other. With Mars Mars Square, you have people who have a real difficulty coordinating uh, or getting their timing together in terms of movement, right? So there's a dis, dis coordination. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, so not maybe physically, but certainly in terms of their activities i want you to imagine have you ever walked with somebody and part of what you're doing has a lot to do with getting into step with them right there's a rhythm you like to get in with the person that you're walking with because otherwise everything feels disjointed so at some point we get into sync with each other and then we start walking in step and then things feel better you don't feel quite so on edge this mars square mars has the same effect except instead of getting into sync with each other, they never get into sync with each other. So it is problematic. Now, interestingly, a Mars square Mars uh, will, <laughs> which completely contradicts what I just said, so bear with me, will energize the people in the relationship, right? So it will um, amplify or, or invigorate the relationship, which is completely different from what we just said <laughs> about that Mars-Neptune conjunction. So remember, the other thing that you get with being energized is also irritated. <laughs> so uh, these two in, uh, in many ways, because that Neptune involvement um, would irritate each other and frequently a lot of it having to do with this, this constant confusion you know, or being late for things and just, you know, always being at cross purposes. So in a normal relationship, well, no, let me not say normal, but in any other relationship where Neptune is not involved, right? What you would get are people who have these incredibly, uh, huge conflagrations in a relationship, right? These, uh, um, I, I can't say it because it's, <laughs> it's an expletive we can't use here, you know, but it's, it's sex or fighting, uh, literally. So they're either fighting with each other or they're having sex with each other. Um, and both of them would be at high, high volume because it's Mars. <laughs> so Mars, Mars square amplifies the energy between people, but that energy, that amplification of energy doesn't always mean that it's constructive energy. Sometimes that amplification of energy is just tremendous amounts of irritation, right? So spending a lot of time together is going to increase the tension level between them because of the energizing or irritating effect of Mars square Mars. Now, this is great if you've got somebody that you're working out with, I suppose, but you can't spend your entire life in the gym or on the bed. Like at some point you have to do other things like discuss budgets, <laughs> go to parties, socialize with people, show up on time for appointments. Um, I don't know, just relax around each other, <laughs> which is very difficult to do with Mars Mars Square. So, you know, had the, <clears throat> cough, cough, uh, had they asked me my opinion, <laughs> I would have said this is a great relationship for a fling um, or for something that's really going to help like kind of break you out of your ruts um, and certainly whoo good god the sex but for the long haul and marriage is the long haul because ideally we're getting married to somebody because we want a life partner a partner in life 
right? Uh, this is not the kind of partnership that will take you through the long haul. So, but you know, listen, they clearly did not know to consult me first. Not that they would have listened anyway, because you know, when that much libido going on, people generally don't listen to anyone or good advice, <laughs> no matter who it's coming from. Okay, so let's move on. All righty, so this is this is still really about Jennifer Lopez and all of her men, right? Um, and again, with relationship charts, we're and anything else actually, we're always going back to the foundation chart that we're working with, and in a relationship. Ultimately, the relationship is built on two foundations, me and you. And in order for us to understand this relationship as it pertains to us, because we're participating in it, we are the other half of this, um, we have to always come back to our foundations, which in our case is always gonna be the needle charts, right? So with that said, the first thing, remember, she's a, a woman with a son in Leo. Women with a son in Leo are just titans of strength. Even if you have the most meek, mild-mannered woman on the planet, if she's got Sun and Leo, don't you kid yourself, inside there is a remarkable reserve of power because the Sun is the heart of the solar system, the Sun is the heart of the chart, and the Sun is in its rulership. So somewhere, somehow, someday, that Sun and Leo is going to rise up in all its majestic glory and it's gonna let you know who's really in charge around here or who's in charge of the situation. So the ability to command and lead, right? And to inspire uh, the best in other people is strong with people with Sun and Leo. Now, whether they choose to, to it, activate that in their life is a completely different conversation, but that potential is there uh, and comes very natural to them. Now, with that said, her son in Leo squares her natal Saturn. This is a, this is, ooh, a challenging position. So on the one hand, this makes her very disciplined um, and very regimented and very determined. So all that power and fixity of purpose that we see with son in Leo and that that charismatic ability to really uh, stick to the vision. With its squaring Saturn, this is doubly emphasized and can go one of a couple of ways. You can either have somebody who's extremely rigid and very controlling uh, and very rules um, uh, focused, right? Which would make them incredibly difficult to spend time around because Jesus, like we know people like this are not fun. Um, or, or it can make somebody extremely charismatic and very purposeful and have the ability to endure whatever it takes to get where they need to go and the fixity of purpose to go for the long haul. That sun, even though it's a square, because remember that's, that square is gonna exaggerate that Sun-Saturn combination. And these are in fixed signs. So in many ways, she is a powerhouse of determination and strength. Um, and command, the ability to command rather than control um, or otherwise. So, you know, there is that. And in a relationship that can be very difficult to work with unless you're very, very submissive and you need that kind of leadership in your personal life or if you're able to hold your own and especially with, with powerful women like this, you're not only able to hold your own but to make space for her to have her platform too. Because this is not somebody like the word indomitable comes to mind, right? This is not a woman who's going to be dominated by anybody. She will rise to the top and stand over it before this is over when all is said and done. So it's interesting because with her, remember, we've got this submissive personality, right? That moon with Neptune um, and Neptune and Mars together. So there's a part of her that genuinely, will, and, and she's very old fashioned, very old fashioned, so there's a part of it that genuinely believes in, you know, men leading and, and taking the dominant role in relationships and, you know, all that sort of stuff, you know, being the good girl, you know, for, you know, air quotes, excuse me for even saying this, but air quotes, daddy, right? Ugh, I hate saying it because it gives me the creeps when I hear that. Um, but, you know, you know what I'm saying. So for her, this works for her. The problem is her very nature, the very essence of who she is, is indomitable. So she needs somebody who can help create a space in their personal life together or their relationship that allows for both of these things to happen. 
And that requires not only compatibility in the charts, but also emotional sophistication and a psychological um, maturity that allows this to happen. So this is no mean feat for her to find somebody that she can love and live with comfortably. And this is separate from the fame and the money, you know, adding fame and money to it on top of everything else just complicates things even further, but more importantly, narrows the field of opportunities for viable potential partners for her even more. So it's, it's kind of a sticky wicket, right? But that's kind of where she finds herself. Now, the other thing that I want you to make note of in this chart with her is she's got this Venus Pluto square, right? So, and that Venus Pluto square is also extremely powerful with Venus Pluto square. However, um, it can create, I'm not saying it will, but it can create a bit of obsessiveness or what appears to be obsessive qualities, right? Because with Pluto, especially Venus, they don't give up. Now, here's what's good about that. If you've got somebody with strong Venus Pluto aspects in their natal chart, they're not going to give up on you so easily. When they commit themselves, they commit themselves for life and they will do everything within their power to make it work. They will turn themselves inside out to make that relationship work. So when they leave you, and this is true for pretty much every Pluto person I know, um, but especially with Venus Pluto squares, right? And just Venus Pluto aspects in general, when they leave you, literally there is nothing left to work with. You have officially hit the limit, right? Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. The, the Pluto person has now just determined that you are irredeemable. <laughs> so for other people who don't have that type of emotional resilience or determination to make something work, it can appear to be obsessive, right? Um, and the other thing too is that Venus Pluto in square, does lend itself to some extremes so they can get tunnel vision uh, when it comes to the pursuit of their goals. So if Ms. Lopez has this image in her mind of what life is supposed to look like, and if she's an old fashioned girl, it's going to be being married, right? Because good women are never alone. You know, good women have husbands that take care of them and children, or at least that's what I hear. I don't know. Maybe you guys have a different definition of old fashioned, but whatever this this circus is in her head that has this complete scripted outline of what life is supposed to be like when that Venus Pluto gets activated and that Venus Pluto will get activated every time she starts a relationship, she will have a, a tunnel vision goal or, or emphasis on achieving that dream in her head. She's looking for this uh, structure that looks like the image in her head of what relationships are supposed to look like. So with people like this it can be very difficult because they may or may not realize that this is what they're doing and they may or may not be able to articulate what that means for them. So when somebody tells you, oh, well, I'm very old fashioned. I mean, what does that really mean, right? Old fashioned how? Old fashioned for who? Like my definition of old fashioned may not match yours. And you know, oh, you mean you're old fashioned except for this part. It can get complicated when people don't have enough self-awareness to be able to articulate these things. Because if you can't articulate it, it's hard for other people to let you know whether they can even do that for you, right? And that's where all the problems come in because, you know, you're not the person I thought you were. Well, if you, if I had known before we started this relationship, I could have told you I was never going to be that person. <laughs> so this is Ms. Lopez, and we're going to get into her chart in much more depth uh, later in the series. Um, so for here and for now, my friends... This is part, the end of part two of eight, Jennifer Lopez and her men. So we will see you in the next segment. If you enjoyed this, remember to uh, let me know by liking it and also subscribing so you can get notification when the next videos come up. And uh, if you really enjoyed it, share it with a friend. All right, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Oh, and also questions or comments. And especially if you remember the history of um, Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck, and uh, Sean Coombs back in the day, way back in the day. If you have any recollection of that history, by all means, like spill the tea in the comments below. <laughs> Talk to you later.